the Barcode Podcast with your host, Chris Glandon, serving cybersecurity straight up with no chaser. Let's hit the bar and grab a drink. What's up, Sid? Hey, Chris, what can I get you? I got nothing in mind. What do you recommend? I got a drink for you. I'll run it through my drink pen test system. What's that? It's our automated pen test service to ensure the security of your drink. Okay, this drink has been scanned with zero vulnerabilities, so you can enjoy your drinks without worrying about any cyber threats. Thanks, man. What is it? It's called the Scanalyzer. You fill a glass with ice. Then, add two ounces of gin and three fourths ounces of freshly squeezed lime juice. Top off with tonic water. Stir ingredients and garnish with a lime wedge. And just like a pen test, this drink requires expertise and proper technique. Here you go. Thanks. Let me validate that. Not bad. Hey, I need to run. An expert on this topic just walked through the door. Okay. I'll see you next round. Nelson Santos is a security professional with years of experience in both attack and defensive teams. He holds multiple top tier security certifications and is trained under some of the best known researchers in the field. His interests range from exploit development and vulnerability research to machine learning and AI. In his free time, Nelson enjoys sailing, playing with his toddler son, and long walks on the beach. Nelson, thanks for stopping by Barco, man. Chris, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, man. Um, So let's talk about automated security validation. And for those that aren't familiar with the term, can you walk us through the meaning of automated security validation and then also help us understand, you know, how it differs from traditional methods of security testing? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that, you know, we've been fighting to get the, the term out there so people to understand a little bit more. Uh, Gartner actually just came out this year with a category for these type of products. Um, but the idea is, you know, as attackers get more sophisticated, they automate their own attacks, you know, their own, uh, their own techniques. Um, the idea is to automate the validation of your security controls, right? So nowadays there are so many letters out there, right? I mean, we're talking about this. I'm here at RSA. You just see the number of companies out there selling defensive software, detection software, and all that. But how do you make sure that these things are all working together? Um, there are tools out there that allow you to do some manual tests, right? And, and pro, pro-like tests and allow you to do that. But with automated security validation, the idea is to have the software to, or the service uh, make the decisions and on how to, to find vulnerabilities, how to then leverage those vulnerabilities um, to see how far an attacker would be able to go and does doing this in an automated way, right? So uh, you don't have to, to manually intervene or to think about scenarios, uh, the tool will do that for you. Um, in terms of advantages, you know, you get more coverage, you get more speed, and you get a lot more consistency as well. And I know you're at RSA this week. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the vendor landscape there? Um, and even outside of RSA as well. I mean, is this something that you have seen become more prevalent as of late? Yeah, I think mean, that's, uh, that's definitely something that we've been seeing a lot more, right? SOAR platforms, right? The security orchestration automation uh, platforms. Uh, I guess they kind of started the trend uh, when you're dealing with, uh, uh, you know, creating playbooks and things like that uh, to automate the whole process. Um, but then it's more usually uh, the sort of tools are usually used for incident response. Um, so what, we're, what, we're try, what we're seeing now is a trend to have the same automation and tests. Uh, uh, and we're definitely, I'm definitely seeing more companies. There are always booths and, you know, we hear more from uh, doing our calls with clients, uh, competitors that are doing something similar. So, and a lot of uh, uh, mixing too, because the bridge and tax simulation tools were somewhat automated, but you still have to create playbooks and things like that. But we've, we've also seen them moving more into that space of being a little more comprehensive and having more pre-built models and things like that to, uh, to perform these tasks. How would you say the concept of automated security validation 
has evolved over the years, um, especially with the COVID pandemic. And, you know, what are some of the major challenges that organizations have run into when either evaluating a specific method or implementing a solution that attempts to solve it? Yeah. So the, I think the main problem has been, you know, that there are so many defensive solutions out there, right? And you need to integrate them and make sure that they work together. But you mentioned something that's really interesting was with COVID, there was this acceleration of people working from home, you know, nothing new here. I'm sure, you know, you talked about this before uh, uh, on, on the podcast and how this opened up people to um, other avenues of attacks, right? I mean, a lot of times we, we, we used to think about this defense and defense in depth concept, right? Where you have the different layers saying you make sure that each of those layers is really strong. But with COVID, uh, it just accelerated a trend that we, you know, we already had before it, right? Of uh, extending that and removing those boundaries. So um, we had the evolution of things like, you know, uh, zero trust models and things like that, but those are hard to implement. And uh, uh, sometimes there are, there are flaws and, you know, and again, they're extremely expensive too to implement properly. Uh, so that's when we started to see uh, an uptake as well on the on the the need for automated security validation um, because it's just too much to cover. You know, back I, I talk to people about this all the time. I mean, back in the days, we uh, if you wanted to to put a new service on the uh, that's was available on the internet, it meant buying a server, uh, having someone install the operating system, install the software, configure everything, make it available, things like that. Now you can do, you can expose a, a you know a brand new service in a few minutes, right? With Redis, Azure, cloud services, and things like that. And so it's so much easier to extend that attack landscape. Um, uh, sorry, your your surface landscape. And um, so you need tools that are automated that will, that would allow you to to be able to to test them and to make sure that these things are protected. Has resourcing become a challenge for organizations, or you know, budgeting for resources? Um, you know, as you're in these conversations with organizations, what have you found to be challenging that prevents organizations from implementing a solution? Yeah. So one thing that we saw, you know, the past few years were, was the team, past 10 years, I would say, security teams have grown a lot, right? You have, uh, um, before you just had security teams, so much to defend, then you start having to come to red teams, blue teams, purple teams. Um, but with that, the security resources started getting more expensive and harder to, you know, to get by. Plus, there was there are limitations to these groups. Uh, even, you know, a good red team exercise is going to take months to set up and, and to, to configure it to properly uh, run through. Uh, with pen testing, same thing, right? The, the, there's so many pen testing companies out there, but hardly anyone's going to have, you know, the budget and the, uh, the resources to, to run them every month, for example. Uh, or um, whatever, even you know, a couple, usually it's going to be a couple of times a year, right, that you're going to be running these, these things. Um, so that uh, introduced, uh, that allowed us to kind of uh, make a dent into that market. Now, to be clear, and to make it you know, very clear, we're not, co- we're not claiming that we can replace uh, a good red team or, or a good pen tester. A good pen tester should be able, a mediocre pen tester <laughs> should be able to go and do things that are beyond, right, what an automated tool can do. It's just like that, right? Like a, a Tesla is not going to drive better than a, a race car uh, a pilot, right? But it will get, get you from, from A to B. And that's the idea with Pantera. It's to take care of the, uh, sorry, of the here. I don't know if you want to remove that, but uh, that's the idea with, secu- with automated security validation uh, is to, um, to allow the, the, the client to get through, you know, and, and do the, the basic and, and medium uh, complexity attacks and, and tests without having to have someone manually come in and perform these things uh, for them. Uh, but in terms of the challenge, in terms of implementing the, the tool, initially it was just not knowing exactly what, you know, what the uh, automated security validation tools were doing, right? Uh, well, in the beginning, when I joined the, the company that I'm on right now, uh, the question that I had, the, the most often was, okay, so how are you different from a vulnerability scanner, right? From a quality or from, from uh, uh, inside VM or one of those tools. And that showed that a lot of people did not even, you know, have the understanding of what exactly it meant to do the, the full security validation. Those tools are for finding vulnerabilities. They're, they're great. They're great at what to do. And they're still necessary, of course. Um, but the, the whole concept behind the automated security validation is to put context around those vulnerabilities, right? By seeing how far you can actually go with them. So to, in terms of, uh, you know, difficulties that we had was an issue was that people just not knowing, do I, why do I need this tool? Right, I have been living with my other tools for for quite a while now. So talking to people and explaining to them 
how to uh, why uh, tool, tools for automated validation uh, were necessary was uh, the greatest challenge that we had before. Um, nowadays, one of the challenges we have is um, a lot of companies are moving to the cloud, and um, our the company I'm you know part of uh, we started with uh, internal uh, doing internal tests and, and things like that. So the cloud was kind of a secondary thing for us. Um, but we're moving to have more and more cloud specific attacks and things like that as well, because, you know, that's where the market is going. Uh, so that's one of the, uh, the challenges that we saw at the same time, you know, because they're moving to the cloud, very few companies though are going to be able to be a hundred percent cloud. You still have that connection between the two, right? That's, uh, that's still going to be a vulnerable point there, um, on these environments. So what would you say are some best practices for integrating automated security validation into the DevOps workflow and how can organizations ensure that security is not sacrificed for speed? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very interesting question. And I think the idea with automated security validation is again to, you know, it's not gonna be as comprehensive as manual tests. You're still gonna have to do those things, but they're a lot easier to integrate with the DevOps workflow, right, as you mentioned. So now as, a, uh, uh, as I implement, as I add a new service to my network, I can automatically kick in like a, a, you know, a new assessment to see how that affects, uh, how that affects the, the, the whole of the, uh, of the environment. Because that's the interesting thing about how DevOps and how a lot of these tests have been done in the past was you see the impact of, a, 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 of an application or something that's deployed on that server or on that application itself, right? You do the tests over there. But a tool like the, the a tool, you know, the traditional automated security validation tool, what it allows you to do is see how that impacts the whole environment. Because now if a vulnerability is found on one, on one, on one machine, for example, it can then be leveraged to jump to another machine where another vulnerability might be found that can then be used to, you know, escalate privilege and perhaps move to another, to other machines and things like that. So I think that the, the, the main impact that tools that uh, automated security validation tools are going to have uh, in DevOps is again, to, to really give them a context around the problems that they find. By the SQL injection on a, a certain application that DevOps just deployed, uh, yeah, you know, it might be, it's certainly interesting to know. It's, it's uh, uh, something that they, they definitely want to fix, but it gives a lot more context when you can actually show, all right, from that SQL injection, uh, we were able to execute this command on the box that allowed us to extract information from the machine and then use that information to move laterally and things like that. So I think that's really where these uh, the automated security validation tools will come in is to allow you to do just have more coverage and you know not look at the at these applications and these services in isolation but really look at the uh, the whole picture you mentioned the importance of not removing the pen tester and i want to expand on that just for a moment um can you further detail your your perspective on balancing the need for automated security validation with the importance of the human factor slash human expertise within identifying and addressing security vulnerabilities? Yeah, I think that's a central point to what we're doing is to make it clear to, you know, to people that it's not a replacement for the human. And the reason is automated security, uh, automated tools in general, right? Um, or computers in general, they're, they're great at finding patterns they're finding things that are not easy for humans to find because just there's maybe too much to cover uh, or things like that, right? So doing the boring stuff. Um, but humans are so much better at doing creative things, right? Than, uh, than the, any machine is. So the combination of the two, of the two, I think it's the, it's really where, uh, the, you know, what creates the, the benefit of having this automated security validation tools. What I mean by that is, I'll just give an example, right? When I worked as a pen tester, um, every time I would go into a client, uh, and it was actually almost like, say 90% of the time, uh, a client would ask me, Oh, are you going to try this? It was many years ago, but still, uh, they would ask me, you're going to try this zero day that I just heard about, you know, that came out last, last week or something like that. And I would say, yeah, we'll talk, let's talk about it again in a couple of days. Sure enough, you go in and you go through the initial motions, just running a vulnerability scanner and then finding to see if the, uh, looking to see if the vulnerability is available on, on uh, an exploitation framework. Sure enough, you're going to find a vulnerability from five years ago, right? On a machine that was forgotten somewhere. Um, or even a, a, a new vulnerability, but something that's, uh, that's already well known and things like that. So, uh, that's where the automation comes in, and it's really helpful. It allows you, would allow you to test thousands of machines, you know, in a, a very small amount of time, 
um, for these automobiles. It actually goes back a little bit to your point. You know, you were asking about not sacrificing security for, for speed. Uh, and that's important because what automated tools allow you to do is have more coverage, you know, to target a lot more machines than you would during a pen test. Uh, but you still want that human to actually, and you know, you want the automated tool to take care of the boring stuff so the human can take care of the more creative things. You want them to spend more time, right, uh, finding the vulnerabilities that are uh, interesting and that are hard to exploit and they require uh, just more uh, um, creativity. And the automated tools can take care of, again, the, the boring stuff. Um, i just stepping back a little bit, but I worked uh, on um, kind of on the blue side of things at a, a big investment uh, firm a while back. And what we did, we used SOAR tools to automate the instant response pro uh, process. And what that allows us to do was not that we, we, we wouldn't look at the incidents anymore. What that allows us to do is just that we can pay more attention now to the interesting things about the incident, right? So the basic detection, making sure, looking for, for hashes, see if they're, they're uh, known or not, that kind of stuff, uh, was all automated. And now we could take care of, uh, of actually investigating the, uh, the malware, see if it was something a little more targeted, uh, what kind of information might have been extracted and things like that. And I think that's true for any automation, including, you know, security automation, uh, security validation automation. Love it. Um, and what would you say is the ideal organization for a tool like this? You know, when you look at SMB to large enterprise, um, or is it really cut for any, any organization? That's a, that's a really good question. And if you talk to our marketing people, and I'm sure they're going to complain uh, to me about it later on, uh, they will say, yes, every vertical. And it's true. We do have clients on every, every vertical out there, right? Enterprises uh, and enterprises, different enterprises for banking, for uh, you know, manufacturing, things like that. But the truth is, uh, historically, mid-sized enterprises, I think, are the ones that benefit, who get the most benefit right out of the box. Because these are enterprises that, you know, they have uh, uh, perhaps a lot of resources, or a lot of, uh, what I mean, sorry, like a, good, uh, uh, a big footprint, IT footprint, but they might not have a security team, a dedicated security team. Or if they do, they don't have time, they don't have a dedicated red team. Or, uh, you know, they can't do pen tests every, every month or something like that. So that's where these tools, I think, they benefit these companies out of the box because they put it in, it's already uh, uh, value added, right? Uh, for enterprises, it does require a little more work, right? Usually they're going to have an environment that's more distributed, a little more complex, so it does require more uh, uh, work to deploy the tool. Uh, and one thing that, particularly with the tool that we deal, uh, or the, you know, the, for the company that I work on, uh, for the internal tests, the tool is self-contained. It's not a SaaS service, and we did that on purpose when the, the tool is being designed. Uh, the idea be, being that you, know, you hold on to your own uh, data and things like that. We didn't want to be responsible for cracks passwords, you know, and things like that uh, on the environment. So uh, specifically for our use, for our use case, uh, it does the deployment on enterprises gets a little more complex. Uh, but everyone can take value out of it because, again, for enterprises, it can still uh, cover a lot more ground than you would be able to do uh, manually. Okay. So what are some of the most important aspects for organizations to consider when they're vetting and selecting a tool? And, you know, how would they measure the effectiveness without the solution vendor understanding the environment variables? You know, what, what questions should organizations be asking? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. And I think the, um, the main point here is they have to have a security program. Now, getting uh, an automated security validation tool in there before they have a, a you know a security program in place. They have uh, a good defensive tools and things like that. It's it. I mean, it will show a lot of results, right? But it's going to be a lot of reds, and it's not really going to give you a lot of value um, because it's just going to show, yeah, you know, things here are very vulnerable, and you probably knew that because it didn't have a security program. So uh, you would you would certainly need to have that in place. So the interesting thing about these tools, then. You know, a few years back, when we, we saw marketing material for these, these types of companies, they would talk about automated pen testing and things like that. But that has moved to automated security validation. And the reason is, you know, you're validating that security program uh, uh, is uh, um, appropriate, right? Not that your IT, not that patching is, is running uh, as expected, because that's something that your vulnerability scanner can tell you, is if the security program itself is good. So my, uh, an example would be, Yes, you put a tool in there and it might be able to compromise, you know, go all the way to compromising a, a, you know, a domain controller or, or something like that. But if you didn't have alerts that were supposed to be in place to detect these things, if it, that, if it didn't have an EDR that was supposed to block it, 
there's no surprise there. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be easy to do it. So the same thing as running a pen test, right, on a company that doesn't have any security uh, uh, controls. So you run it the first time. My suggestion would be run a pen test the first time, and then once you have something in place, then you get an automated tool. Right, to uh, uh, to test these these things. So it's not about size. And that's something that's interesting. I got a lot of questions. Well, uh, my environment is not big enough to have this. I don't think that's true. You know, it, uh, sorry, it's not that that's not true. I'm sure it's true sometimes, but it's uh, uh, more important than size is just the maturity of the uh, uh, of the program. And it's interesting because sometimes we get companies that are very have you know very secure, uh, uh, sort of very mature security programs, and what they see is the automated tool is great at validating that really you know they are secure. And not just because it doesn't show anything, because they can actually detect they're sophisticated enough that they can see all of the attacks that are being tried. And they can say, ah, yes, you know, I, I know I'm supposed to be detecting this thing. I know I'm supposed to be blocking these, these, these types of attacks and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so just, you know, circling back, I think that the, uh, the important thing for a company to have, if you're looking at automating your process, is to have a process in place in the first, time, <laughs> in the first place, right? Uh, I think that's something that's, uh, that's very important. And I would even argue, you know, before getting the automated security validation, do some internal or, again, just an external, you know, uh, a company should do a pen test or something like that. So do it manually a few times to understand what, what it should look like uh, and then automate. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, you know, get a baseline first and then you can determine afterwards how it augmented the process, right? Exactly. And it's not supposed to be a comparison. I mean, I, we talked about this right uh, a while back. Is the, it's not that, that these tools are going to do more than a pen tester will. But still, it should, at the very least, do some of the stuff that the, the pen tester did. It should be able to find some of it. So. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. So let's transition into the product you're representing, Pantera. Um, tell me a little bit about the history of Pantera. Sure. So Pantera is a pioneer uh, in this space. Uh, there are other companies that did some automation. I said British Tech Simulation has been here for a while. Uh, but usually the philosophy was always to have you know, an agent or something like that installed. It's more of a probe, right? It, and they're amazing at that but the more probe tools. Um, but Pantera itself started, it was, uh, uh, it's an Israeli company. And it started when a, a colonel uh, with the IDF, uh, he was in charge of a unit that did exactly this. It tested the, their government and the did pen test for internal systems. Uh, when he left the IDF, he uh, started Pantera. And that was five, uh, well, six years ago. Uh, and he started Pantera and just basically got a lot of people that used to work for him at the IDF to work at Pantera. And it's still like that. A lot of, most of our researchers and all come from the same unit that you know, he used to be part of. Um, and that's where, where it all started. They started automating. And in the, in the beginning, it was kind of a, uh, you know, an overlay over uh, open source tools and, and things like that. Right? They did the automation part, uh, but it did rely on a lot of uh, open source tools and things like that. But as the platform evolved, uh, it became um, our own thing. It's now, you know, we develop our own exploits because one thing that we noticed from the beginning is that safety, of course, was very important to clients, right? When you're running an automated uh, anything, <laughs> if you're on an automated car, right, you don't want it to crash anywhere. Uh, if you're on an automated security validation tool, something that's exploiting vulnerabilities, you want to be sure that these exploits are safe to run. And that's something that has been embedded into Pentair since the beginning. We'd rather not exploit something there are a lot of vulnerabilities out there that can be exploited, a lot of techniques that can be exploited safely. So we would rather not cover something uh, if there's any danger of, of uh, blue screening a machine or you know, impacting the environment. Now, obviously, we're talking about IT. So there's <laughs> always a possibility of something breaking. Uh, but we take a lot of care, a lot of QA uh, into making sure of that. But anyway, just going back to the history. Um, so that, you know... From uh, that initial product came Pintura Core, which is our main product. It does the internal uh, test. So the idea here is akin to an internal pen test. Right? Uh, you put a machine on the environment with the, the, our software, and the, that machine is then going to start doing the attacks uh, from that point of orange. Um, and last year, we came out with a new product because there was just a lot of customers asking for something that could do the same thing before the outside in. And we came out with Pintera Surface. And Pintera Surface is a different philosophy. It's a SaaS offering. So, and the idea is to do the same, right? Well, of course, the attacks are different. Uh, it's always some overlap, but you, the, the attacks and the, the approach is different from, from core. But the idea is the same, is to not only find vulnerabilities, but exploit them and see how far you can go uh, by leveraging those vulnerabilities and, and issue, the security issues. So you talked to the feature set, um, but would you mind expanding on the differentiators and, and talk to the factors that have contributed to 
Pantera's success thus far? Yeah. So again, you know, when, when I joined, when I joined Pantera in 2020, um, the, the main thing that we needed to differentiate from was, uh, vulnerability scanners. So I'll start there. The difference is, uh, the vulnerability scanners stop at telling you the vulnerabilities. Pantera and, you know, automated security validation uh, tools in general, they pick up from there. So the idea is to see how that vulnerability actually affects the environment uh, and give you, you know, the, the, the pump there. Um, and then, you know, last year, the year before, 2021, 2022, uh, we got a lot of, okay, so how are you different from breaching attack simulation tools? Um, our main differentiator, and again, for other tools on the same uh, um, uh, bracket that we are, uh, is that uh, we don't use agents, right? The idea is not for you to probe something. It's not for you to get a deep understanding of how, where, you know, your EDR is failing on this uh, specific attacks. The idea with, with Pantera uh, and automated security validation in general is to do coverage. So you would start uh, uh, and to, to simulate as, as, as well, internally, you know, at Pantera for the marketing people, we don't even say simulate, we always say emulate uh, because the idea is to, to really perform the attacks uh, uh, and uh, the tech, use the same techniques that the attackers are using. And we, we do that both for the penetration testing side of things and also for the ransom emulation and, and you know, all the other modules that Pantera has. So Nelson, you've been in this industry for some time and you really understand this space specifically. So I'm curious, how do you see automated security validation evolving in the future? And how do you see Pantera evolving as well in securing our digital infrastructure and networks? Yeah, I think... Well, one thing is obviously cloud, right? Uh, a lot of tools out there are, are looking at cloud, but usually there are two separate things, right? A lot of these tools are looking at, at, at the cloud environments. They have full access to the environment, so they leverage whatever APIs are available uh, um, to look at vulnerabilities and things like that and misconfigurations and those things. Uh, automated security validation is usually, you know, it doesn't it doesn't have those claws, right, into the, uh, the system. Again, similar to the rich attack simulation tools. We, we don't have agents. We don't have direct access to, you know, these uh, uh, cloud APIs and things like that. But in the future, what I'm seeing is these platforms dealing better with these uh, hybrid environments, right? So being able to leverage, all right, I exploited a machine on the internal environment and I found a, an API key uh, on, this, on this machine. Now, can I use, or whatever, like, you know, um, let's say an AWS key uh, on this machine. Uh, can I use it to now access resources that are on the uh, on AWS on Azure or whatever it is the, uh, the the cloud provider, and you know, kind of jump from from an attack that's internal to an external one. Uh, the other trend that I see is just basically forgetting about this external and internal thing, integrating the whole thing, and making sure uh, that uh, and that you can emulate an attack that's let's say starting from the outside and then continuing all the way in. Uh, to the uh, uh, to the to the environment. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting, and we're already implementing this, is kind of uh, integrating more with threat intelligence, right? So, for example, Pantera has a leak credentials uh, feature that allows you to once you onboard a domain to the Pantera external, uh, we we partner with threat intelligence companies and we just buy anything that's available, right? Any credential, any credentials available for uh, those domains that are uh, that are in scope. These credentials are then used for attacks. Because, you know, again, anyone out there can, there's a lot of companies that do this, that show you the, the leak credentials. But what Pantera is doing is, yeah, I don't care about the leak credentials itself. I want to use them to uh, perform an attack. And you can also use them to perform the internal attack as well. So, um, you know, integrating more into threat intelligence and, and, and these other tools, even with uh, uh, phishing platforms and things like that, to not only show that the client clicked on an email and it opened, you know, and he clicked on a link that he shouldn't have clicked, but actually continue the attack from there. Not only did they click on it, but that actually allowed uh, so like Pantera to get into the machine, run a certain code there uh, that considered the attack from before the environment. So um, I think that's what I, I, I'm seeing. Um, you know, I imagine I'm going to be seeing more in the future. Uh, better integration with um, tools like SIMS, uh, EDRs, and, and all these things to uh, you know, be a little more uh, um, descriptive on how uh, a technique was successful in, in these things. I think uh, that's something that's really important, too. So you're at RSA. I got to hear about this booth setup. <laughs> yeah, you guys killed it last year at Black Hat, and um, and for those that weren't there, Pantera had this boxing ring set up on the expo floor and had real life boxers sparring in the ring. Um, so yeah, you guys definitely killed it. What do you have this year at RSA, and can we expect it again at Black Hat? 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I love that uh, the the booth that we had last year as well uh, for Black Hat. It was a lot of fun. Um, this year we we're doing something a little different. Uh, we're doing rap battles. So the idea is there, we actually have someone from uh, uh, you know, well, both of them are actually professional um, rap battle artists, I guess. <laughs> uh, and they are each representing one side. So some some of the the the, the battles they have is about hacker versus uh, sorry, an attacker versus defender, uh, automated versus manual, and they you know make, make the verses and they they're doing these these rap battles on stage. Uh, we have a DJ, uh, so there's a little the whole thing the whole booth has it looks like a little club that they look like a club and he has a, a you know, the DJ. There's always the, the music playing, and then from time to time we have these these rap battles. Um, I like the setup a lot. I think it looks really interesting this year as well. Uh, you're going to see the same thing if you go to Black Hat. Uh, we're actually taking the same booth there. It's going to be a bigger booth than it was last year. Um, but I, I think it looks really cool. Uh, and it's an interesting, very interesting uh, um, concept, I think, at least. So, I like it. Yeah, it's definitely interesting, man. And um, and being that this is Pantera, you know, my money's on the automated battle rapper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... One of our better rappers was a finalist, and again, I'm sorry, but I completely forgot the name of the, uh, the program, but it was a program on Netflix um, about you know, rap battles, and the, the, one of them was a finalist on, on that program. And obviously, he's the one representing the automation, he's the one representing the Defender and all that, so <laughs> <laughs> he's the better one. <laughs> cool, man. And you mentioned Pantera is Israeli-based, right? Yes, it is. Have you ever been there? Yeah, uh, yeah, oh yeah. The team, um, so the SCs, they go from, from time to time. I've actually missed the first trip that, that we did, uh, but I was there for a sales kickoff. Um, it was great because uh, it's the, the company's in Tel Aviv. Um, we did a lot of events, Tel Aviv, a lot, and some other places. So it was really interesting. That was my first time yeah, in Israel. So. Nice. Did you get to explore the area at all? Unfortunately, what, what they did was, I guess, what they do a lot of times with these things, like they, Packed us. There was a lot of interesting stuff to do, but they packed us. Like we didn't have a lot of time to do exploring or things like that. Uh, but in a good way. Like we just had a lot of activities, uh, but not just internal activity, but just you know for fun stuff as well. Um, but yeah, but it, it was really interesting. I definitely want to go back and you know explore a little bit more. Um, but it was really cool. Um, I suggest for anyone. Yeah. So did you come across any cool bars while you were out there? <laughs> so yeah, there was a. Uh, it was kind of a tiki bar. It was right on the beach. The hotel we were staying was, was right on the beach and it was gorgeous, which again, I've, I've seen it before. I know some, some movies, the, the, no, some like a TV, whatever, uh, the, the beach in Tel Aviv and really they are gorgeous. So that was fun, but even better. So after we did the events there, um, they flew us to a lot, which is in, in uh, the Red Sea. And it's uh, you know, this, I guess, well-known uh, uh, beach resort uh, town. And, we had a party at a, um, a camel ranch, um, which is really cool. Uh, so, you know, we had, it's, it's all set up, right? It's a bar and everything, but you just sit. Actually, even before that, we had uh, an event at this, on this mountaintop, but it's in the desert, right? So it was not right by the, uh, by the ocean. And it was like, in, like a desert tent, like a oasis type thing with sofas and everything. You can just sit there, drink. Uh, uh, so that was really cool. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the other the the camel uh, uh, ranch was was really awesome, like the, the whole environment uh, and everything. While we were there, the uh, the people from marketing were saying, "Oh, you know, you guys are gonna love this because they have like some live music and uh, explain. You guys are gonna love this. This is really big." And um, so this band starts playing and just you know, rock and roll, good music and everything. But then when I look at the the actual stage, it was a big stage. I, again, the whole company was there, so it was a you know, big venue. Um, it's a bunch of puppets. So, but big ones, like, uh, you know, the forgetting sort of Marshall. And then at the end, they have those, those big, I guess, Muppets, they call it or whatever, but the big one. And it's those things. Thing, I mean, of course, there are people there <laughs> playing, but it's with those things. And it, it's funny because all these really people are going crazy. Oh my God, I can't be, believe you guys booked them and things like that. And we're like, yeah, who are these people? No, again, it was really fun, but it was really interesting to see that. Like, I guess they're famous in Israel, but not very <laughs> outside. Uh, and again, they, were, they played really well. Um, <laughs> but the band <laughs> played really well. And um, yeah, but it, it, it was really good. Um, so yeah, I'll send you the, the, 
the link. I'll find it and I'll send it to you because it was really, really interesting. Like, uh, you know, just the decorations and everything. It's like the sofas and all of that and the, on the copper tent and all that. So it's really cool. That's awesome, man. Um, so my bartender's over there pointing at his watch. So I have one more question for you before we get kicked out. If you opened a cybersecurity theme bar, what would the name be and what would your signature drink be called? All right. So to keep it a theme, uh, name of the bar would be Bottle Overflow. Nice. And uh, the signature drink has to be Penetration on the Beach. Nice. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to put this bar on the coastline, right? Right. You have to do it. <laughs> you have to do it. Beautiful, man. We'll definitely search Caipirinhas as well. And Penetration on the Beach is going to have uh, leach condensate. Is that condensed milk? Yeah, sorry. Condensed milk. <laughs> Cool, man. Well, before you run, uh, let our listeners know where we can find you and connect with you online as well as connect with Pentera online. Sure. Uh, so uh, LinkedIn, of course, is just place to find me if you want to talk directly. Uh, but Pentera.io is going to not only tell you about the product, I recommend you visit, even if you're not interested in, in Pentera itself or something like that, The we have a library session uh, where our researchers put a lot of uh, uh, papers about the techniques that Pintera uses. So the cool thing is that you look at the papers, and of course they might mention you know, the, the cover is going to have Pintera and things like that, but it's not about the product. It's not a teaching about the product itself. It's teaching, for example, what techniques were developed to evade EDR, uh, or uh, what techniques were used to connect remotely to uh, an environment and perform you know, tests uh, on that environment, things like that. So I recommend going there, uh, even if you're not that interested, into, that interested in, uh, in the product itself. Yeah, the LinkedIn, um, yeah, just Nelson Santos. Uh, you definitely find me. Very easy to recognize. I mean, look <laughs> the same on the picture there. So, uh, yeah, do, you know, reach out. And uh, um, I'll definitely love to talk about any of the, the things we discussed today, security-related, machine learning-related, all of that. I, I love that stuff. So. Nelson, thanks so much for stopping by, man, and, and sharing your insight with us, man. It's been great. I appreciate it. You take care and be safe. So, Chris, thank you for the opportunity and you know for giving me the time and to, <laughs> for listening to me. So, this was really fun. As you know, Barcode is where security and IT professionals hang out after a long day. So get your message front and center to our fans by sponsoring an episode or live show. Learn more at barcodesecurity.com slash sponsor. Cheers. Unfortunately, it's time to shut the bar down for this episode. Thanks for stopping in. See you next time. We'll save you a seat. Be sure to check us out at barcodesecurity.com.